uh, I would like to, uh, to bring forward and introduce to you my colleague, uh, Eleni Bastea, uh, who will introduce the guest speaker. Eleni Bastea has been uh, teaching in this uh, school for at least 10, 12 years now. More than that, <laughs> and she's the professor of uh, history, and also he, she is the director of the international studies. She is an amazing writer, and her goal is to not only to speak about uh, history, but also to bring together the other elements of architecture and design that are not really thought sometimes like a memory, like existence, like history through our own families and our own cultures uh, to bring another, another dimension to architecture, which is that uh, by becoming more and more contemporary, by becoming more and more universal, we have a tendency to forget these things. So, so please uh, uh, welcome Eleni Bastea. Hello everyone. First of all, I want to thank Eftimius for um, bringing the guest lecturer Hongchen in his class and uh, therefore uh, giving us a captive audience and um, I know it will be worthwhile. I also want to make um, a little introduction about the International Studies Institute and the lecture series of which uh, today's lecture is a part. So the International Studies Institute is an organization within the College of Arts and Sciences that oversees an international studies undergraduate major, and we have over 200 students there. And it also undertakes um, outreach programs, lectures, um, films, documentaries, uh, roundtable discussions, that deal with um, international issues, that is issues that um, address our own concerns as well. So for this fall semester, our um, annual lecture series has the general title, Modern Societies in Crisis, Global Challenges and Solutions. And I actually want to thank Tanya who helped phrase the title in a way that it actually captures people's attention and a colleague was saying, that's a good title, I think I'm going to use it. So um, a little bit of background on the general questions that we are um, bringing forth in this uh, two-week lecture series and there is a poster um, outside the, in the lobby. During the last five years, if not 50 or 500, we have witnessed unprecedented upheavals that have pitted the principles of democracy, multiculturalism, and respect for human dignity against often intransigent political and religious positions. Concurrently, the economic crisis affecting several countries within the European Union has caused increased unrest within and beyond the European Union. Speakers in this series have been addressing the crisis of modernity <coughs> from the local to the multinational levels, comparing developments around the world, and examining problems and proposed solutions. We believe that uh, modern societies in crisis, global challenges, and solutions will enhance the community's understanding of current political and economic upheavals and their effects on New Mexico and the Southwest. And you can also go on our website, International Studies Institute at UNM, and uh, find the complete set of lectures. I also want to thank, um, first of all, the speakers involved in this lecture series, like Hong, for making it possible, for um, sharing their knowledge and passion and questions with us and also colleagues and departments within the university for financial support, and that includes the Office of the Provost, the College of Arts and Sciences, University College, the Feminist Research Institute, Department of History, and the Peace Studies Program. And also we were fortunate to have outside support from uh, two other 
groups, the New Mexico Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the Colorado European Union Center of Excellence and uh, the European Union. That's the background. So the, the pleasure, uh, and I guess the honor, but definitely the pleasure of um, introducing today Hong Chen is ours. Hong, um, I, I have a kind of two or three different profiles about him. He is design director, associate principal of Steinberg Architects China, and he has been in that position for 14 years. Before that, he worked um, with Kaplan Chen Kaplan for five years, and that firm was in Santa Monica. And he also worked with Urquieta Zecchetto in San Francisco. And before that, pretty much right after uh, graduate school, he was uh, at uh, Moore, Rubble, and Goodell office, uh, Charles Moore's and Associates, from 1986 to 92. Another way to um, maybe introduce him is to quote from a little um, interview that I found where the question was, what inspires you? And his answer was, the extraordinary in the ordinary from nature to design. And then another question was, what was your most memorable space as a child? And his answer, imaginary spaces in novels and film. And finally, I want to add that um, I first met um, Hong in graduate school at Berkeley in the 20th century. <laughs> and uh, at the time, he was Tony Chen. And in the process of the master's program, he recovered his Chinese name, Hong. And I'm wondering if his talk today, after working in China for many years, is another way of recovering the Hong or the Chen, uh, the Hong or the Tony, or connecting the two. I don't know. Not by design. All yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the podium. I'm really grateful uh, to be able to uh, speak to people other than clients and city officials and actually talk about ideas rather than trying to sell something. Yes. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite a pleasure for me. And, and thank you, Lenny, for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture program. And uh, I know that um, you know, it goes well beyond architecture, which is what makes it even more uh, compelling because um, the title doesn't have one word of architecture in it. I think that's what's, uh, uh, that's what's uh, it, uh, compelling to me because uh, when Steve Jobs, uh, I, I digress a little bit, but when Steve Jobs came back to Apple and he, the first thing he said is that we're not designing computers anymore because you had to go beyond what you're doing. You had to design he said, we're designing lifestyle now. And so that's how you, uh, how you uh, challenge any uh, given uh, uh, profession by not staying within uh, bounds. And this is cross-disciplinary, which I think is what everybody needs to do. And, um, and I think uh, when the world is, is in crisis, and China's been in crisis for the whole, entire last century, and the U.S. has been through crisis as well, the Great Depression and so forth. Uh, so, and it's what you... Uh, how you react to the crisis that, uh, that makes you great or not great. <laughs> so, uh, so, I, so I think um, when, when we uh, look at design, we have to uh, look at the same way, beyond design. And, um, and I, I think that this, this lecture is, uh, is actually not about architecture at first, but it uses architecture to uh, couch uh, the question. The global, uh, modern societies in crisis, global challenges of solutions. Uh, I, I was kind of inspired by yesterday's uh, uh, lecture by David Henkel. And it's uh, not about architecture at all, but, uh, but somehow it does touch on architecture uh, inevitably because, because architecture is uh, not the kind of art that you can store away. Once it's built, it affects everybody. 
Uh, so that's, that's why I, I have a passion for it because whatever I do, whether it's, it's, it doesn't matter whether you achieve fame or not, whatever you do does have impact uh, for better or worse. Uh, so uh, there are buildings that I've been disappointed with that I drive by without looking at. So as you, you can see that it has a long-term impact and uh, as long as the building lives, it continues to have impact. Okay, let's uh, turn to the uh, lecture. I brought some visuals because uh, architects by nature are not very verbal, so, uh, so hopefully this, uh, this will uh, get everybody going. Um, so, so today we're gonna cover a few things from, uh, from the broad to the uh, uh, down, down to architecture. So it's from the big questions of uh, the societies in crisis. And of course, uh, my views from the armchair. So um, I, I'm, no, uh, I'm no professor or trained, uh, uh, or, or trained uh, author um, of any sort. So I don't, uh, so everything I have uh, here today is uh, gonna be very subjective. I don't pretend it uh, has any uh, ounce of objectivity. But I think, um, I think from, from here, um, you, can, uh, you can see that, uh, that to, to look at the world, you have to, uh, you have to go from broad uh, to narrow. How many, how many people have uh, been to uh, China? Lived there? I know one is actually from China. <laughs> so so I, th I think it's... Uh, it's actually important to, uh, if you have the opportunity, to uh, see as much of the world as you can. And I, th I think my life's changing uh, turning point was uh, when I went overseas to study uh, in my junior year. And that's when I discovered, of all things, architecture. I think talking to the it's, uh, it's clear that you can plan your life, but uh, life happens, uh, happens to you when you're making plans. Uh, <laughs> and uh, China did happen to me when I was making other plans. I was actually uh, uh, sliding towards mode of retirement. And then suddenly I'm yanked out and actually uh, into six years of, uh, that's probably tougher than any time in my career. And uh, if I had known it, I probably wouldn't have done it, but I'm glad I didn't know it. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, Okay, China is uh, very complex, and I, obviously I can't cover it uh, in one short lecture like this. But uh, so, th so this is gonna be a very quick uh, comparative look at Shanghai and maybe a little bit of New York City just to see some precedents. Because what's happening in China is, is not without precedents. I think uh, before I went to China, everything I've, I, I see is through lenses of the news media here. And, uh, and also my own prejudices. So, uh, so I never really wanted to be in China. Uh, and I did all, uh, my best to avoid all the opportunities that, that was offered to me uh, uh, during uh, my early years uh, in, in this career. And, and then um, something happened. Um, US slowed down and uh, we were competing for work in China. And I went for a, uh, uh, for a comp uh, design competition. And I went there for, uh, for two weeks and ended up six years. Uh, so life does happen to you when you're making other plans. And um, so, so we're gonna look at, um, look at some precedents and see why uh, this uh, Chinese gold rush has uh, precedents in the American gold rush. In China and the US is uh, somehow off by a few decades. Whatever happened to the US uh, is somehow uh, is happening now in China. Uh, so, so I'm gonna compare the US um, from the Great Depression when, uh, when the country was uh, uh, falling into the abyss and uh, somehow they were building great buildings. Uh, so just like in China, uh, the, there's a great po uh, economic polarization. The poor again are very, are very poor and the rich are getting very rich. Uh, so, but, the, uh, but the government is uh, very careful that uh, the, the polarization doesn't go too far uh, to, uh, to, to a point where you may have 
uh, Arab, Arab Spring or uh, uh, something similar. So there's, so, so there's always uh, some check on this. And, uh, and then we're going to look at how uh, we can grow together with China and other countries rather than uh, uh, competing unhealthily or even lead to conflict and uh, more conflict and crisis. And then, uh, of course, uh, being an architect, uh, my views from the trenches of architectural practice. So I'm going to bring you down to the trenches and uh, show you some of the things we've been able to achieve and some of the success and failures. You can't always just talk about uh, uh, success. Yes, um, most, um, most, most of the, um, the most, most, um, most of the time when you um, sell projects to clients, you try to show only the best side of things. Uh, but I think uh, to learn, you need to see both. So here we're going to see uh, what, we, what we learned in China that may have applications to uh, uh, maybe your life and, and career if you choose to go in this uh, direction. And then, of course, uh, there's also the, uh, what lies ahead in China, because China is in the fast-changing mode. And even the, uh, the best people who write for Wall Street cannot predict what's going to happen next. Uh, and a lot of uh, the articles have been proven wrong because China has its own dynamics, its own, uh, its own economy, because it uh, has enough critical mass. Just like the U.S., it could be isolated from the rest of the world and somehow still be able to move on. Okay. And speaking of moving on, we're going to move on here. Okay, let's have uh, some comparisons. So China is roughly the size of the U.S. You don't see Alaska here, so we're, we're very comparable. And, um, and you can see that some of the cities, um, the, this, uh, the China map probably should move up a little bit. Uh, so you actually, uh, you actually have Ch Shanghai lined up with New York because they're very similar. So that's why I'm comparing Shanghai to New York for this uh, talk. Uh, uh, for, the, um, for, for time's sake, uh, just a few, uh, couple of buildings. And you can see that uh, Chicago is your hub and we do a lot of work in uh, Chengdu, which is roughly about here. Uh, so, and uh, Chengdu is an uh, interesting uh, town because that's the town uh, that I landed in uh, the first time. And it's actually uh, like Chicago, it's the big hub. And now it's uh, not just, uh, before it was, uh, during the war it was the military hub because all the, all the weapons and everything somehow gets channeled through there. And, and now it's actually a big hub for, uh, construction and other things. You, I've seen more cranes there. I missed the Shanghai episode, but I've seen more cranes there than I've seen any, any time in my life. Almost everywhere you went in that town, there were cranes. And Chinese provinces are divide, divided very naturally, always um, uh, by geography. Uh, so if you have uh, if, if you actually uh, know Chinese, I know uh, uh, there's one person at least in here that does. Um, they, they, they all sound strange, but uh, once you know the meaning of it, it actually is, uh, are very interesting. Because, uh, uh, say the province that Mao Zedong comes from is Hunan. That means it's uh, south of the lake. And Hubei is north of the lake. So they all have geographical uh, meanings. And uh, they don't, they're not square like New Mexico. They all have very natural borders. So when you cross the river, you know you're on the other side and not in the middle of the river or, uh, or somehow uh, at the corner of your house. So China's uh, got beautiful natural resources. But, uh, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of it kind of uh, disappeared uh, during the big move forward. Uh, so. Um, and also, the, there's another reason is that um, most of the stuff, unlike in Europe, they're built in wood. Uh, so, so they didn't last as well. But on top of uh, all the crisis that's, uh, that's been happening continuously to the country, so a lot of things that have been uh, ravaged and destroyed. But here are some uh, things that are still uh, left to uh, enjoy. And you, you see, these, these villages are more in central China. And then there's this uh, giant Buddha uh, which is uh, many, uh, you can see uh, the size of person is uh, many stories tall. And around this Buddha uh, is where a lot of my projects have been. 
Uh, so, uh, so I think it's uh, predestined. And then what also, um, to Chinese, it's, uh, they, they, they would uh, laugh out loud when I tell them this because, uh, because I always thought Ch uh, China was very uh, mono-ethnic. Maybe they all look like me, uh, but uh, where clearly they don't. <laughs> and actually this woman uh, down to the right look more like most of you. <laughs> and, uh, and what's interesting is that they speak perfect Chinese. <laughs> so it's a really colorful country. The country, uh, climate-wise, is mostly gray, but, uh, uh, but the people are extremely colorful. And then uh, to, to build China, you can't forget the, uh, uh, the ultimate symbol of uh, uh, China, the panda bear. And this is uh, uh, especially a uh, uh, good picture to have uh, for this, because this is the panda bear after the, the crisis. The panda bear after the big Sichuan earthquake. And I arrived uh, right after the earthquake. And these panda bears were saved from the mountains and then fed milk. So we, hopefully uh, China would, uh, is on the path to restoration architecturally and environmentally and otherwise, just as these panda bears are. And since, uh, since 1978, China's been on the path of reform, economic reform. And that's what's triggered this uh, big uh, leap forward. There's been other political leaps forward, uh, but this is uh, the leap forward. And it all happened if you're old enough, like me, or like me, <laughs> uh, you would uh, have witnessed uh, Nixon shaking hands, uh, at least on TV, with uh, Mao Zedong. And that was earth shaking because uh, at the time I thought China was a mythical country. Actually, it is a very mythical country. You know, there's a lot of myths, uh, just like uh, uh, the Greeks and Romans all have a lot of myths. And that, I think that's what makes the culture very rich. Um, so, so there was a point where I didn't believe that country actually existed in real life, that, that it's really you know, just exists in myth, until I saw Nixon shaking Mao Zedong's hand. <laughs> and that kind of uh, 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 shook everything up for China. And from then on, it's a different story. And that handshake uh, also uh, obviously impacted my life. And, uh, and since then, there's been a rush uh, towards uh, uh, rapid and excessive growth. Uh, at least uh, to our eyes, it's very excessive because uh, they use up uh, a lot of the raw materials that, uh, that we would be using here. So in competing, uh, in competing with them, uh, we actually have to pay higher prices. So there's a lot of complaint from our end uh, that uh, they're causing prices to go up and also competing for our jobs. But um, I, th I think what, um, the reason a lot of uh, historic architecture uh, didn't make, it way, make its way to today, it's because uh, there, there was a period where they just want to start anew, start from scratch. It's not, uh, it's not unique to, uh, to uh, the communist Chinese, uh, because uh, Le Corbusier, I don't know if you have studied history, uh, architecture history this far yet, but Le Corbusier had uh, the plan uh, for Cité of Ideas, and uh, that was supposed to, um, at least when he saw Paris, he thought it's abominable. He wanted to wipe Paris clean. And uh, I think there was similar attitude at the time that anything that's uh, laden with history and, um, and culture has to be uh, let go in order to start from scratch. So you can see from this, uh, uh, this picture, it says uh, basically, uh, uh, break everything that's old uh, in order to build something new, in order to build a world that's new. And so from, from 78 uh, to now, this, the, these figures are a little bit outdated, but, but it gives you a sense of uh, how China's become the world's factory. And that's why we have to take notice. And so things China makes, uh, See, everything, the percentages, they're all up there. Uh, all the computers you're using, the, the novel that I'm using, uh, they're assembled in China. And I know that uh, my, my, all my brothers have uh, done business in China. Uh, so so it's, it seems like, um, at least in uh, my circle, uh, not few people that uh, I know 
have not been affected by China. And this is our current leader in the uh, lower right. So, uh, so ch I, I have to be extremely uh, uh, brief and cartoon, uh, 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 cartoony with all this because of time. And so, so you, you have uh, traditional architecture, they tend to be more internally oriented as, of, as opposed to uh, uh, American architecture or the European architecture, which uh, has your front yard and so forth, but instead of uh, you know, a garden wall. And especially this one, uh, this uh, looks like a, a silo, which uh, before the, the country opened up, US suspected, US uh, satellites saw this uh, in southern China and thought they were uh, w weapon factories. Uh, so so, so uh, until, uh, until they discovered they were actually ancient housing uh, <laughs> that houses uh, uh, multi-generations. And then, um, so through the last century, China has seen everything. China, China is very interesting because uh, I think this is what I'm uh, uh, coming to learn, uh, that they, they have a very, very high capacity to absorb outside influences. They've been invaded by Mongols, and they, uh, somehow they still stay a country. Uh, so, so, and then the Mongols left, and others have come in and out, and, and you know all the concessions that's been given to European countries, uh, French concession uh, especially, and, uh, and somehow they still uh, stay uh, one country, one culture. Uh, I think it's uh, a tribute to their uh, ability to be very flexible and uh, also always uh, curious of uh, uh, what out outsiders have, even though they were a very internalized country. And, and clearly, as you can see here, they picked up a lot of European eclecticism and European classical revival, but somehow uh, there's still a, twin, a t tinge of Chinese in it, and, uh, and also European art deco. And these, uh, this is in uh, Shanghai, uh, where, where I live. And, uh, and so from the post-reform, and this is the, this is the uh, founder of the new uh, Chinese Republic. Uh, if you all have seen The Last Emperor, that's where, when he started. And then, then from the post-feudal, uh, uh, then there was the communist uh, revolution that took over the country and uh, sent the uh, uh, president of the republic to Taiwan. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, this history. But um, <clears throat> so they went through uh, an era of self-discipline where they uh, become very self-critical and, and try to uh, adopt the uh, uh, Soviet uh, model of uh, socialism. But, um, but, but as, as I just said, China, uh, the Chinese are very, uh, uh, they're a very uh, um, uh, flexible and uh, very curious group. And they're able to go from um, this era to straight into something that's complete polar opposite, the economic reform, which you you've all are witnessing right now. And here's some numbers. So I think this is uh, what's triggering all this massive uh, production, is the Chinese, Chinese population started at 10% in the cities. And in the US, that was the uh, turn of the century. So everything is somehow slightly time lag behind the US. So I think it's very apropos because you, you, you're Americans, we're Americans. Um, that we uh, compare China directly to us rather than compare it to other countries in the world. And you see classical revival in the US as well. Because the US have been through almost, uh, uh, Ch Ch Chinese almost going through the motions that US have been through. And, and US um, have been trying to uh, tell China to uh, skip some of the steps uh, as, and not have to go through what uh, we have to go through. So you see the classical revival which uh, happens on, on both continents, but just at different times. And th at the time, US urban population is much higher than Chinese. Chinese. China was more of an agricultural country.
and then uh, starts uh, during this period, economic reform period, it starts to grow uh, to 35 percent, and U.S. population uh, more or less stayed put. And Chinese catching up, and they're projecting in 2035 it will be 83 percent in cities. So it's, uh, it's rivaling the U.S. in terms of urban population. And the current reality is that the cons uh, Chinese consumption is increasing as well. So that's actually, uh, as, as we learned yesterday from, uh, from David Henkel, uh, resources, uh, com competition for resources also creates crisis. So as, chi as China all want to be more like you, uh, start to drive cars. Uh, as I give up my uh, cars for bicycle, uh, somehow Chinese are driving cars. <laughs> and profit margin is not small, but uh, very surprisingly, uh, they're very f the proportion of architects to the population is very low. That's why architects over there are very, very busy. And and the expansion is exponential. So here are two charts. You can see the proportion of inhabitants to architects. Uh, China and then uh, the next country, I think it's, uh, I think it's Spain or uh, uh, some, some uh, Western European country. Uh, so the proportions, uh, that, that's why there uh, are they're, they're two reasons they welcome uh, uh, outsiders to come into design. One, I think one is because of this uh, this uh, very disproportional uh, uh, ratio between inhabitants to architects. They just don't have enough architects to build there. And the other is that um, um, it's just that I think there is a very, uh, a, they, they fancy a lot of things uh, outside, especially architects with uh, good brand names. And you can see that uh, the, dens the density as you approach uh, Asia, it gets higher and higher. Uh, so of course, the, I, think, I, I think the uh, bigger crises are brewing much more in Asia uh, than here. And somehow, I think China is turning that to their advantage. I think that's, that's what I mean when you, when you should uh, always look at a problem and challenge as an opportunity. I, I, think, I think Eleni and I back in school have, uh, have coined that. Uh, you know, uh, design, uh, design is really making opportunity of constraints. So here we have huge problem in population-wise in Asia, and let's look at it as an opportunity. And, but bef before all that, there, there are several uh, currents. I'm not part of this current where, um, uh, where um, architecture becomes uh, iconic or fashion statements. If, if it's appropriate, um, I think I welcome it, but I think in general, in general, to solve problems, it's beyond iconic architecture. Uh, I think most of the architects uh, that are uh, working in the dark are actually contributing more to the field and to society uh, than uh, these that are uh, the more sensational ones. And here you have all the brand names uh, they've. Uh, they've all landed there at one time or another, or some, uh, some are still there. So at, at this point, it's still about uh, speed, quantity, and, um, and also um, a brand name. And, and it's not, uh, no surprise then that uh, a lot of the bigger buildings are in China and not elsewhere. As you can see, there's a, a tremendous competition to, uh, even after 9-11, to build the tallest tower. Uh, and right now, uh, right now you can see here, uh, this is what I call the, um, the spring roll. It's, it's kind of rising to become the world's second tallest building in Shanghai. It's almost topping up. Okay, back to, uh, back to uh, the U.S. Well, as I said, New York City is a lot like Shanghai. And just in China, there's an intense competition in New York to build the world's tallest skyscraper, and that's uh, right, after, right around the Depression time. 
And when people are uh, uh, having the largest crisis, but somehow there's this uh, huge renaissance in American uh, art deco skyscraper architecture. So Chrysler barely made it to the top. It's the world's tallest building, and Empire State took over. And what's, what's very interesting is that um, both buildings, even in China today, are considered uh, built too fast. And you can see here um, that this, if, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, I miswrote this, buildings which produce drawings in just two weeks. Uh, did anybody know this before? So this is uh, one of the most iconic buildings in, in, uh, in the country. It's almost like uh, uh, the movie Casablanca was written on the run. And it's one of my favorite movies, but somehow they didn't know how it ended. They, they kind of just had to, uh, I think design is kind of like that. You just had to find your way uh, to the destination. Uh, and I think uh, it's actually it's uh, very enlightening to me that this all occurred uh, before China uh, had its moment. So, in two weeks, I, I don't think I could have done my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, another thing to uh, take note is that uh, they actually uh, shamelessly copied from this uh, building uh, in, <laughs> in the, in the le lower, lower left. Because uh, you're pressed for time. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of Chinese architects for uh, not being original. Um, uh, my old master used to say, Charles Moore used to say, the originality is the bane of 20th century architecture. So everybody's trying to be original. Everybody's trying to make the next shocking statement. Uh, so why not just uh, do it right? Uh, so yes, uh, it's, it's, I think it's important uh, try, uh, to try not to copy uh, uh, you know, and try to have some original thought. But sometimes uh, you have to look at the context. I was extremely critical of, uh, uh, of uh, Chinese architectural practice before going over there because I see too many copies, including copies my, of uh, buildings I had worked on 20 or 30 years ago. I went to China, they, there are copies uh, in massive quantities and, in, and built in much better materials than, uh, than our stucco. <laughs> you know, so, so there's the money and resources to do anything they wanted. And at that time, uh, even its depression, somehow uh, they were able to come in on, t uh, on time, actually ahead of schedule and under budget, which is uh, absolutely shocking uh, be because uh, e even now it's hard to do that in China. There's tend to, things tend to go over budget. But, uh, but when it happened to us, uh, Europe, uh, I think Europeans were looking at us as uh, the way we are looking at China right now. Uh, that actually, what's, uh, what's this wild, wild west over there? Uh, you know, are, are people not civilized enough uh, that they have to do things uh, in, in such a rush? But, but you have to understand they've been uh, pretty much shut down for an entire century. You know, different, uh, uh, they colonized in different ways, if not physically, uh, mentally, and culturally. You know, so if you just look at Shanghai, a lot of the buildings there are actually quite Western. Uh, so you can see, uh, you can see the scars. And uh, and, and we have our own scars. But, um, this, this is uh, when post-war, uh, what you saw before was uh, post-depression. Uh, so post-war, we did a lot of things to our environment uh, that uh, now we don't look back on uh, for, uh, for more lessons. But uh, we, uh, we what we did actually is in some ways uh, just as bad, even though it's, uh, you know, even though we didn't uh, populate it with skyscrapers, but we pretty much eat up virgin land. I think there's one, uh, one saving grace in what's happening over there is that um, uh, you, you're forced to be, uh, concentrate cities in, in very uh, limited area rather than keep spreading. So, there, so you can still have, uh, uh, have countryside left. Uh, or in the U.S., you can only have uh, military bases between San Diego and L.A. to keep them from becoming one town. Uh, so, so, so I think uh, in some ways we have to become self-critical as well. 
to, is, uh, is what we're doing because uh, there are a lot of things they're doing over there uh, are very bad for the environment. Uh, but we have uh, done uh, things just as bad. Okay, now we, uh, we've seen New York. Uh, let's look at Shanghai. Well, here's a Manhattan that's, uh, that happened in 30 years. Actually, some told me uh, the bulk of it happened in 15. Uh, it's uh, almost just as big. Uh, but, uh, it, sorry, the left side is the old Shanghai. See, it's uh, mostly European built. And, and somehow I, I, I feel uh, a lot, when I was in Austria, I probably felt uh, this, uh, uh, this much uh, Euro of uh, European street. Uh, but uh, strange to find it again in Shanghai. Uh, but when you look across the river, this is, on, the bund is on the river, Huangpu River. When you look across the river, uh, this thing right across the, uh, the river is where my mother told me, because my mother is actually from Shanghai, so it's very, uh, uh, very strange that I'm back there that she's not. Um, she said uh, nobody wanted to be there at the time because it's really just rice fields. And uh, even back in, uh, uh, back in 1978, it, it was mostly still rice fields. And, and now take a look at it. Actually, the, the buildings, uh, the tallest uh, three buildings are all done by uh, uh, people that I actually have uh, become friends with in, in Shanghai. And they're, uh, but they're t taking over the skyline just as uh, Chrysler and Empire State and Woolworth Building have back in uh, the, the late 20s and early 30s in New York. So, so this is the Jingmao Tower, which you, you will see me mention a few more times. And this is uh, another building by KPF. And this is uh, Gensler's, uh, the tallest one, which uh, is almost like transparent egg roll around the core. And this is old Shanghai shopping street. And right when I arrived, they were preparing for the uh, World's uh, Expo. And, and right before that was the uh, Olympics, uh, which probably had the biggest of everything, biggest opening ceremony, biggest, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, so the World's Fair tried, uh, tried to do that for Shanghai as the uh, Olympics did, before, did for Beijing. <coughs> so they were really trying to uh, use the opportunity to showcase Shanghai. Almost every street, including my street, was completely opened up. And the whole bun uh, along the river was opened up. So there was really no sightseeing. So I was very disappointed. I didn't really want to go back. Uh, it was uh, rainy, cold, dreary, and, uh, and every street, was, you had to walk around construction. But right before uh, the 210 World Expo, miraculously, everything got sewn up. So the streets suddenly became complete and beautiful. And I, th I think this is where uh, that, that I can say it can only happen in China, uh, just as the Olympic openings uh, can only happen in China. Because somehow, uh, uh, I think culturally, they're more predisposed to working uh, together in a large unit. And then there's... Uh, probably architecture that you haven't seen, but it's also done by foreign architects. This is actually done by uh, uh, the famous Italian architect, Grigotti. China, as you can see on the right here, all these uh, new towns that, that, that have been built in Shanghai alone. Uh, <clears throat> across the country, uh, there are uh, many, many more. And in, I think at the, at the time I was going there, they said they were building a new, new town every month. <laughs> so, uh, so, the, so these things are staggering. They're, uh, they're probably unprecedented in history, but proportionally uh, I, uh, to population, I, I think they are precedented, uh, preceded by the U.S. So this is done in a very contemporary style, but, uh, but didn't quite uh, uh, get along with the climate. Uh, so it's aging very fast. Uh, so I think uh, there's a lesson to be learned there about uh, what uh, Khan and Kobu are very good at is uh, how to build with indigenous and, uh, methods and materials. 
and here uh, I think when you're trying to impose uh, Italian skills and materials on uh, Chinese populace, it's going to come out uh, very fast aging. And uh, so the other side, which uh, you don't hear much about, you only look at nest, bird's nest and uh, other iconic architecture that, uh, that's been dropped on China by foreign architects. Uh, this is probably uh, re some, some, somewhat the residue of um, uh, their colonial past. Because somehow when people uh, get, to, uh, get to money, or uh, I think uh, someone can translate for me here, the, the, the explosive rich or the new, nouveau rich, when you suddenly explode it with new money, uh, what, where, where, how do you want to spend it? I want to buy a European villa. Uh, so actually, this is uh, much, in much higher demand uh, than I believe uh, uh, these modern skyscrapers. So that, this is uh, the side that, uh, uh, that actually initially was very troubling to me because, uh, because I've been asked to become more postmodern than postmodern. <laughs> and you, they really want to leverage, to, uh, leverage your, uh, your knowledge of uh, your European past. Uh, there was, I said, well, some, sometimes you get, um, you get this. Well, you know, that's, that's why we ask you guys, uh, we're paying more for you guys to do it because you're from that side. <laughs> and, and some of this is done by uh, foreign architects and others by uh, local architects who are picking up on it. And Frank Lloyd Wright is uh, something that uh, architects and, and, um, and developers can some, somehow meet eye to eye on because it's, uh, it's still somehow acceptable to both sides. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll let you look at this for one minute if I chime in. And then there's also the follies. And this one, interestingly, is actually a photograph taken by a, friend, a mutual friend of ours, Eleni and mine, uh, Bill Hawker, who's, who actually goes around the world uh, to take really fine pictures. And, and he has a really uh, good eye for, uh, <clears throat> uh, for things that are different from us. And, and this is uh, at a very extreme case. I'm not, I'm not gonna uh, sugarcoat anything because uh, there, in a, a country that's in upheaval, it has uh, both good and bad happening to it. It's how they deal with it that, uh, that we, should, uh, <clears throat> uh, we should take note on. So, so this is uh, something, the forces that are beyond us that's creating, uh, because the populations are moving to the city so fast that they couldn't build enough housing fast enough. And sometimes they speculate wrong and they become ghost towns. And when they speculate right, they become a slummy. <laughs> So, so this is what I'm uh, trying to avoid. And as you probably uh, saw in my little blurb, that uh, as, uh, the, the impact China has had on me is uh, kind of reinforcing what I already believe in, which is that uh, the object making is important to architecture. But really, space making, I think, is even more important. Because, uh, because all, all these are uh, just the, all the apartments may be uh, more comfortable than uh, what they have in the uh, villages that they, they've been displaced from. Uh, but, but they really don't have any great public spaces. And you saw earlier in, this, uh, in the drawing of Cité Radius, it's really uh, spaces with no character. And when, uh, when nothing works, uh, the, the, um, what they say, suck, suck eyeball kind of uh, architecture. <laughs> yeah, the, which is they, they, they take uh, three men out of uh, Chinese myth or history and blow them up into a hotel. <laughs> so, okay, so now we're, uh, I think it's, it's uh, hard not to tell, tell the story from the trenches uh, where I'll be back in uh, next week. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so let me share some, uh, uh, I had to be very selective because uh, in, in just uh, six years there, we've probably done uh, uh, probably three times as much work as we would have uh, in the U.S. Uh, so I, I had to really cherry pick a little bit. 
but, but not to, uh, not to overlook uh, some of the uh, bad projects either. So the, Chengdu is in central China, and that's really the hub that I mentioned earlier. And that's where I first landed, and that's still where I have most of my projects. And now they're starting to uh, spread around, in, including uh, Shanghai, where our office is. And southern China, which uh, is really our entree, because our first project was a master planning project in Hong Kong, which you'll see uh, very, very soon. And uh, Changsha is also where we have uh, quite a few uh, projects on the boards, and, uh, and also some that are uh, uh, just uh, concept projects. And in Beijing and uh, Tianjin, we have a lot of housing, commercial, and now a lot of hospitality for one of the richest men in the world, and, uh, and arguably the richest in China, but we never see him. <laughs> uh, but, but somehow his, his chain of command is so, uh, uh, so uh, military-like, uh, we somehow get his uh, blessing or no blessing uh, through the chain of command. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very interesting how it's run, because uh, uh, the, uh, the empire has ended, but the emperor lives on in different uh, powerful clients. Uh, and this, this is the uh, very, very first project. It's, it's in Hong Kong before entering the mainland. It's really, uh, I, I, I don't have uh, space to show other drawings, but before there were high rises where this green roof building uh, is shown. It is supposed to be a convention center and hotels for visiting faculty and uh, friends. This is for, uh, for a university in Hong Kong. And we're supposed to plan the whole campus, but um, at, at first it was a huge struggle because they don't want any real outdoor spaces. They want all the public spaces to be air conditioned. Uh, so like, uh, uh, like they say, you have to talk to the indigenous, to the natives. Mm -hmm. Before you, uh, before you, uh, uh, yeah, before you impose uh, your prejudice on them, because I, I would have uh, uh, probably uh, done something if I didn't listen to them. I probably given them something that they can't really use. So, so here is really uh, where all the public uh, traffic is uh, through the, through the corridor, through, uh, through the tunnels, and through the buildings. So in, in this in this. Uh, a little thumbnail, you can see even better uh, how everything is through the spine. And this is our first project on the mainland. This is a competition that I referred to earlier. Um, this is a real river, um, a really beautiful river that snakes around. And somehow we, uh, sh we sh uh, cut it short here so we can turn this into an island. But, and also, by turning this into island, we avoid the setbacks, so it's actually usable. So um, unlike the high rises you saw, we really tried to uh, give it um, a different character. It's all s surrounded by spaces. So even the high rises uh, are creating uh, courts. And, and all, instead of putting uh, the previous, uh, the previous uh, firm was uh, let go because uh, the scheme they had had all the most expensive units fronting the river, and everything else is kind of hiding behind it. Uh, what we did was we turned it around, so all the spaces are like a fishbone with the island being the spine. So everybody gets partial view of the river, and so they can become more of a community. So they can actually share the natural resources. And here's uh, our first clubhouse, and which we had to do for free. <laughs> and this, this is uh, how it goes. This is our first experience. And I, I show you these sketches because they were drawn right after the site walk, with no floor plans, no program. They just want to see what you're thinking. They said, just uh, tell us uh, how, what it should be. I said, well, give, give me the program. Well, uh, we don't know. <laughs> Just show us so we can react to it. And so so, so this, this is kind of from their description that they want something that's more akin to American National Park, which is more uh, <clears throat> you know, just natural stone and, and, and wood 
and uh, somehow in, uh, in tune with nature, uh, where you have the dry and the wet somehow interwoven through each other. And then, uh, then it actually forms the bridge which becomes the gateway to the, the new uh, residential community. And, uh, and this, uh, this, this actually, um, I should actually go back. So, so this, this is our first uh, little project in China. And they, they said, sorry, we can't give you a, a bigger one. Uh, you should just start with this, but you have to start right away. And it's over 100 acres. <laughs> uh, so, so obviously, we were overwhelmed. We tried to do it back here, and nothing worked. Everything we sent over got rejected. Uh, so we're, we were on the verge of being fired. And so, so we packed our, our bags right away and, and went over and actually sat down and listened to them first. So they really want something that's more like a national park uh, inn which is really, uh, from any angle, is, is different. It keeps changing as, uh, as you walk around it. And it actually is integrated into the landscape. So over here, just like Franklin Wright's buildings, is actually one story. By the time you get here, it's three to four stories. Because it works with, this, uh, with the slope of the uh, land. And also tucks away a huge volume, which in our earlier scheme uh, wasn't tucked, uh, so it resembled an airport. And also, we persuaded them to uh, not <laughs> be so American, uh, even though uh, they wanted something uh, American because of the visit to the American National Parks. Uh, we persuaded them that they should have some references to the earthquake-stricken area, which had a lot of these towers. And uh, these towers, actually, some are up to 1,000 years old. And they are a part of that landscape. And, uh, and somehow they took to it, they, want, uh, they allowed us to marry the, uh, the two, uh, the American uh, rustic and, and the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Lo. Can I say it right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> and uh, so, so you see the happy union here. And, uh, but in order for this to happen, we went through a lot of challenges because uh, uh, because you can only pile stone up uh, to, uh, you know, I think it's, it's up to 10 meters, and from there on, uh, there on up, it has to be a different type of construction. But it has to look continuous from the outside. And this is an, uh, <clears throat> another uh, lesson on having to listen and adapt. Here we're trying to impose a very European vocabulary on, uh, on our Shanghai clients. <clears throat> And this is uh, supposed to be a combination of hotel, clubhouse, and, uh, and Soho living. And, and these things could be done very well in Germany. But in Shanghai, uh, it's a challenge. Outside Shanghai, it's an even bigger challenge. So that's what it became. <laughs> that's something that, uh, OK, let's uh, run to Sichuan given uh, time constraint. And so this is a sketch that I. Uh, I tried to persuade them to do something that's not uh, just uh, planting skyscrapers. <coughs> and they took to it, but then uh, they abandoned it. Uh, but what's left, uh, but we, it was all, not all uh, for naught, because uh, uh, we actually saved on the clubhouse. Uh, so what you will see is more the clubhouse than all the high rises we designed. So these high rises, we're trying to give them something that's I, I, I nicknamed the falling leaves because all the uh, some parts are transparent and some, and some parts uh, look, look like leaves that fell uh, fell down to villas to become villas. So because there's such such a drastic change in scale, instead of building down the scale which they rejected, uh, that they uh, that that I kind of came up with this to uh, make it a little bit more special and uh, and. And there's, and there's a problem because they want to place the clubhouse where it's most visible. But, uh, but it's very hard for the clubhouse to compete with skyscrapers. Because all, all the residential are planted skyscrapers. And, and it's, it's not just the clubhouse that gave me some hope that, uh, that there's a great future in China. 
It's also the skyscrapers, even though we're not doing it now, they're actually advising the next architect to not do all skyscrapers, they actually do mid-rises. That, that maybe there's still a few skyscrapers that they're doing the build up. And so, and pay more attention to spaces between buildings. So they are starting to sculpt spaces. And this is uh, my first sketch for the clubhouse, looking from the top, uh, of, uh, uh, top of the creek. <coughs> Go, uh, from the top to, to the bottom of the creek, it's about uh, 13 meters. So times three, that's uh, over 30 feet. So these are all the roofs of the clubhouses. This is the bridge um, connecting to the, the long pedestrian spine that connects to the high rises. And these are the roofs of the clubhouse. As you can see, it's kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, become part of the landscape rather than competing with the high rise. And the, the creek uh, also joins the uh, swimming pool, which, which really looks like uh, just a, a reflecting pool with a waterfall. Mm -hmm. So this pretty much, uh, this is something uh, we, we proposed. And when I first proposed it, the US office was actually against it because uh, because they thought that would never fly. Because in the US, it definitely would not fly. Uh, think about all, all the leaking roofs that would uh, result in lawsuits. <laughs> but, uh, but somehow, uh, there was absolutely zero resistance. They jumped uh, at the idea. And, and then the whole concept was the story. They really want to hear the story about walking through the bamboo forest. So the whole experience of the clubhouse is walking through bamboo forest. So we lost, uh, we lost uh, the design for the, all the high rises, even though we finished designing it. But, we, but somehow, I think the pure joy is in the smaller projects. And this is uh, the, the entry at the uh, buried hill. So, so everything from, uh, <clears throat> from the uh, pedestrian side is pretty much buried. And as you walk through the forest, uh, the, the bamboo, uh, the ceiling is a series of ban uh, abstracted bamboo. And some happen to be uh, light fixtures. And then the wall is a series of, uh, of Horton steel, where now it's become copper. So you had to somehow um, <coughs> uh, uh, roll with the punches. Because the, uh, how did the design go? The design is almost down to the last drop. Yeah. We actually did most of the design during construction. Uh, so, so all, all the uh, schematics and the design development, they're mainly for them to uh, mainly serve as food for thought for the client. <laughs> so you had to really contain yourself. Um, but but uh, imagine the opportunities, then uh, it's easier to do that. And this is down the corridor. And then as you walk through bamboo forest, you come to a clearing. And that's a clearing. And, and you can see the, the cortin steel or the bronze uh, so, so morphs into the hall and, be, and becomes a giant stair with, uh, with multiple platforms. And that's, this is where the, uh, the land splits open, like, <clears throat> like one of those uh, uh, stones that, uh, that are colored inside. And then you need some uh, rest, some respite. And then you, you stop at the coffee shop. And the, 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 whole, the entire uh, bamboo ceiling continues into the coffee shop. And the last I heard, they actually want to use real wood uh, instead of uh, PVC. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so all the structure uh, came from the shape of the roofs, which are uh, kind of frozen green waves. And as you look up, uh, you see the exhibit hall on the other side of the cafe. And this, this was the initial sketch for it. So, um, so, so some of the things, uh, in spite of struggles, uh, actually the structure and everything went through huge hurdles. They, uh, they did it and then uh, it was wrong, they had to be taken down and did it again, and uh, it had to be done in steel and then covered with concrete. 
So everything we, we think would be straightforward here, um, you actually have to do it more circuitously over there. So just uh, in terms of scale, this is all at, at a pretty grand scale because the country is right now in, in transition through a very uh, grand stage. And because they're all competing with each other. Uh, everybody's building a clubhouse, seems like, these days. And everybody's trying to do something that's different. This clubhouse is just not big enough in the area. So they try to make it tall enough. <laughs> <laughs> and also, they want to make it different from the others. They don't want anything that has pre-existed. Uh, so this, this whole clubhouse, even they describe this way, it's a journey. Seems like it's all a lot of, uh, like walking through the bamboo forest, is you have many stops many, uh, and many destinations. They said, they said that uh, d differentiates them from other clubhouses where you come in, everything is much more defined and stationary. That's why you, you saw earlier, there's the long corridor. It's just like the path through a bamboo forest. You don't just enter directly. You have to go through a V-shaped funnel. Through, to, into any major space, you actually go through a V-shaped funnel, which is formed by the plan uh, twisting 15 degrees to, uh, to go along with the river. And you can see from drawing to uh, construction. And then uh, there's uh, some water in the forest. <laughs> okay, so uh, there were some found spaces. Uh, this, this is how things happen. You always have to be prepared because when they want something, they want it tomorrow or even yesterday. Uh, uh, so we found this space because they, they took a different approach. Instead of piling dirt, uh, they actually uh, uh, used concrete slab to form the hill, part, or at least a part of the hill. And underneath the slab, uh, there, uh, there was this uh, big space they didn't know what to do with. And the owner actually collects wine. Uh, is a very serious collector. And he wants something that's uh, different, that he can have personally, only shown to his friends. And we said, well, this space is perfect for it. <laughs> it's a found space. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, the, uh, so some of these uh, small jobs, that's how they come by. They, uh, uh, they happen along the way, and, uh, but, but when, they, when they wanted it, they wanted it uh, right, right away, so we had to do a sketch and a model for them immediately. And I'm not showing you all the drawings. So it's, this, this, uh, this drawing, uh, you can already see that the, all the uh, wine racks have become a form in itself. So there's just really just three materials, the concrete itself and <coughs> uh, uh, copper, or, uh, or bronze that actually comes down, becomes the, the, the gate, which is hidden, and then uh, it goes up into a ramp to the second floor and comes back at you. And the entire wall here is uh, all for wine storage. So, <clears throat> so because, he, because his, um, he has just too many bottles, so we, uh, we couldn't quite fit it in. Uh, so we decided to make it a uh, wall feature. So, th so this is probably the simplest project uh, we've achieved in China. Usually uh, you're asked to, uh, to uh, somehow uh, you know, spruce it up you know, with more details. But, uh, but, so we, we really, um, we're not a brand name uh, architecture firm, so we actually have to uh, touch two extremities. Uh, we had to do things that are as traditional as they come to some, something when the opportunity exists uh, that are as, uh, as unique as possible. So this is one of them. And this is not, sometimes not even on the company radar because it's just too small. Uh, so, uh, so it's contractually, there are diff difficulties because uh, uh, you just can't make the numbers work on this project this, uh, this little. But, but these are the projects I really enjoy. <clears throat> and uh, so this is uh, looking from the, the bridge that comes up, the ramp to the bridge that comes up. And, th and this led to another, uh, another opportunity which, uh, which um, basically uh, it's do or die. If you, if you didn't uh, pr provide a sketch, uh, then you probably missed the job. So they have this, uh, <clears throat> this villa uh, that they want to turn into a model home. 
And uh, we said, well, we, we don't do model homes. Um, they said, well, no, no, this is different. You can, you can do it as an architect would do it. Uh, so, uh, so we kind of took it on and uh, did the design in two hours. <coughs> and then they just kept, uh, uh, kept hacking at it through uh, uh, different uh, renderers. But, uh, but in the end, we rendered it ourselves because there's just uh, not enough time. And this is the, the, the shell of the building is already there, so we have to actually work to it. So th there's a story to that one too, but I'll skip it. Um, so the, oh, okay. So there are these uh, tiny projects which you just saw, and then there are these uh, enormous projects which, uh, uh, which we're having trouble getting uh, a, lot, a lot of times because there are too many stock attacks after it. And this one, we actually won but then they gave it to Foster. <laughs> um, so this is actually infill projects, which is uh, something that I really enjoy because I, I feel that this is uh, architect's best contribution to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to uh, the city fabric. Because too many are, build, are building isolated monuments. I think uh, this, every city is begging to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to be somehow um, uh, sewn up. And here is actually a huge opportunity to uh, uh, to place some residential in Soho between um, some old factories. And, and this on the river, that's actually quite uh, smelly at the time. And over there are where all the star architects are building high rises. And, and f further are, is the egg roll high rise and all the, the, the Shanghai Manhattan. Uh, so, so it has a really, uh, uh, really impressive uh, line of sight. That's why they want to develop it. And then there's a lot of the existing uh, Shanghai uh, uh, old housing, which you uh, try to preserve as well. And this is my first uh, slice through the old buildings uh, with a, a new uh, <coughs> added in. And how we weave through uh, some, of the <coughs> some of the buildings to create streets and also how to uh, restore the river. Okay. Because there's only five minutes, I'm gonna run through this very quickly too. This is actually a city, we, we won this competition against uh, other foreign firms. <clears throat> and uh, this is a city for 150,000 people. And we just did the planning only, and that, that's really what we're asked to do. And it actually has an existing lake in, uh, in, <clears throat> in the town of, uh, of Chairman Mao. Yeah. And uh, it has a very strong access to develop into the future for the ecological business district, because there's a lot of ecological parks around the area. And as you can see, the, uh, all the different components that we put down. And this is an overnight sketch for the competition and where they want this iconic tower, always, and, uh, and also a street uh, that's supposed to uh, <coughs> compete with the existing historic downtown. And then there's a big 10, a 10 meter drop, which is supposed to uh, be a waterfall that you drive under through uh, that's supposed to also pr uh, produce electricity. So there's a lot of, it's very ambitious, but now it's on the, at the standstill. And this, uh, this every project uh, that, of this uh, size that we do actually has a video that goes along with it. Because uh, nowadays it's getting harder and harder to uh, sell ideas. <laughs> and this, this is at the expo site there. Uh, this TV company wants to study how to, because they, they own very, uh, uh, very uh, sparsely uh, sprinkled uh, sites, and they don't know how, how to uh, make them uh, sing as a whole. Uh, so we did a, a week's charrette uh, to, uh, to kind of give them some idea. It's, a, it's more a feasibility study turned into a project. And then uh, more uh, land study, because even though Shanghai is built up to the hilt, 
there's still uh, these studies going on that, that uh, they only allow you weeks to do, or sometimes just days. Okay, looking ahead, what's, uh, what's in store uh, for China? I think, um, I, I think if you are designing spaces, you can have bigger impact on, uh, on uh, the country. And here we, we have the next uh, market that will just keep growing because there are as many seniors in China, uh, we're getting, I'm getting there uh, very soon too. There are many, uh, as many seniors in China as there are people in the United States. So they need senior housing even worse than we do. And they only have one, uh, one child families, um, or most of them. Uh, so, so, so this is the, the new uh, uh, growing market in the future. And I think, uh, and I think how it works out there, uh, uh, if it works out well there, it bodes well for the rest of the world. But we thought we could uh, translate what we did at Stanford University, which they saw and liked, uh, to China. But, uh, uh, but it, uh, kind of, we kind of have to start over. Because to translate to that culture, it took us a whole year to redesign it. So you had to look past the, uh, I showed you some uh, modern uh, works, but you had to look past the, the Northern European uh, vocabulary because, and just look at the spaces. <laughs> uh, because uh, I, think the, I think in the end, uh, really, uh, my, my, my central message is really uh, to, uh, uh, to really persuade a country that's uh, moving that fast to focus not more on object making but on space making. Should we ask okay. Yes. Anybody has a question?